This is the sound of people fighting over toilet paper rolls somewhere in Melbourne at a grocery store. Hi, it's Thursday, 12th of March, when I'm recording this sixth episode of the second season of the Quality Talk podcast. I'm Prashant, and I'm a media person who lives in Melbourne, Australia, and I create this podcast every week where I talk about topics which matter to all of us. Topics we don't get to hear about often, definitely not as often as we should, or we need to. If you want to find out more about me, um, there's a lot of information in the second episode of the podcast where I shared my entire life journey. So yes, in Melbourne, Australia, where I live, for the past two weeks or so, there's been a collective panic situation. People have been buying toilet paper rolls and other everyday use products like ready-made pasta and canned food items in bulk, presumably as a fear response to the spread of the coronavirus. Many experts, doctors, health professionals, journalists, researchers and community leaders have come out and warned people that this is irrational, that buying toilet paper or food items in bulk has nothing to do with coronavirus. In fact, this is only going to create more problems, especially for people who might actually need this stuff more than anyone else and won't be able to find it. Last week on Saturday when I went for my weekly grocery shopping, I was surprised to see shelves, entire shelves totally empty. I had been reading about it and it was trending on Twitter as well, but when I saw it in person, I realized the full extent of it. In my suburb, we have one main grocery store because the other one is under construction at the moment and shelves where toilet paper is usually stacked were completely empty and so were several other shelves. My first thought when I saw this was, why is everyone doing this? This is just panic. Stocking up on toilet paper or canned food items has nothing to do with coronavirus. And then very quickly, I found myself experiencing this shared sense of panic. I too started feeling anxious that I am left behind, particularly when I could not find certain things that I usually buy and the store assistant told me that they might get some more stock on Monday. Having to wait a few more days to buy things I need created anxiety in me. I could feel a rush of thoughts like, what if they don't get these things in time? Will I be able to find them on Monday? What else can I buy today? And this in fact leads me to the topic for today, anxiety, which is one of the most common mental health conditions, not just in Australia, but worldwide. In many countries like the United States, anxiety is the most common mental health condition. Much like the United States, in Australia, anxiety disorders are the most commonly occurring mental health condition. They can affect children, teenagers, and adults. This entire incident of panic buying and stocking seems like our collective anxiety has been multiplied by a factor of 100. This seems like a manifestation of irrational anxiety, something we all experience in varying degrees from time to time. I'm sure you all know that there are two common forms of anxiety, a rational or a predictable one. So let's say if there is a hungry animal approaching someone and they are standing in front of the of the animal with no means to defend themselves, it is rational for them to experience anxiety and this is predictable. And then there is the irrational or unpredictable anxiety, which is what this entire panic buying of toilet paper seems to be. Some psychologists have also suggested that this situation is our attempt to exert control in a situation which is beyond our control. The good news is that anxiety disorders are treatable and learning about them is the first step. So let's discuss some key aspects about anxiety with an expert. Our expert today is Professor Jayashree Kulkarni, Director of MAPRC, that's the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre here in Melbourne, Australia. 
Professor Kulkarni is a renowned psychiatrist and a researcher who not only founded MAPRC but also has many achievements in the field of mental health, both nationally and overseas. In fact, I consider myself very lucky that I was able to talk to her because she is a pioneer in the field of women and mental health, which is what I really wanted to highlight in this episode, given the fact that women are more likely to develop anxiety in comparison to men. And coincidentally, just a couple of days ago, we as a community marked the International Women's Day. Um, so here it is, my conversation with Professor Kulkarni about anxiety. Dr. Kulkarni, Professor Kulkarni, welcome to the podcast. Um, it's not just a pleasure, but an honor to be able to talk to you about mental health and anxiety disorders today. Oh, that's very kind of you. The difficulty will be getting to stop me speaking yeah. too much. <laughs> Man, that's all right. Um, so let's start off with a very simple but a very important question. How is anxiety defined? What is anxiety? And when does anxiety go from something that anyone and everyone can experience to becoming a medical mental health condition? Yes, so anxiety, as you've alluded to, is a spectrum condition. And at the one end of the spectrum, it's a very mild um, form of a drive so this is quite a useful thing to have. It gets you up out of bed and it gets you doing things. It will get you studying for exams or trying to be on time for a meeting and so on. So some anxiety is useful. The difficulty becomes when, of course, it interferes with functioning. And I think that's possibly a good way to think of most things uh, as going from normal to abnormal. And it's when it interferes with capacity to work and capacity to love. And uh, that's loosely Freud's definition of uh, work and love. Um, so anxiety in the form of um, many of the illnesses that we know, um, such as phobias, generalized anxiety, uh, compulsions and obsessions and all of those uh, fall into the realm of illness because the person cannot function. Different forms of anxiety manifest in both physical and mental symptoms. So for generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, the person has a number of different um, symptoms including the physiological, so they can get a fast heart rate, they can sweat, they can hyperventilate, they can have aches and pains in different parts of their body, they can have problems with their vision, all sorts of things that are physiological, as well as psychological. So the person can believe that they're about to have a catastrophic event happen. They can be hyper vigilant, looking around them the whole time. They can um, ruminate, constantly go over things and over things. They can feel very poor in their self-esteem or have a very low opinion of themselves. Um, they can narrow their whole world because they're scared um, that something bad will happen so they don't do much outside the house or take risks. So there's a spectrum and different people express their anxiety in different ways. That's a really good point you've touched on and I think um, you've already covered my second question which was about the common signs and symptoms of an anxiety disorder. So let me let me ask another question. Like, Are there reasons why anxiety disorder settles into a person's life? Um, is there something that happens? Is it external or internal? From your experience as someone who's been working in the field for so long with so many people, what have you noticed are some of the common reasons anxiety develops into a disorder? So I think the, one of the things that we, we really hold dear in psychiatry is this concept of biopsychosocial. So what that means is for any condition, there are biological factors, psychological factors, and social or environmental factors. So if you took anxiety disorder, there are biological factors. So for example, um, there is now quite a, a large number of um, genes that are associated more with anxiety disorders. And so what we're saying is that there is a biological component there are changes in brain chemistry. There are changes in brain hormones that also drive brain chemistry. So these are the biological factors. The other biological factors are when people get physically unwell. So if somebody develops a heart disease or they develop a cancer, the side-by-side -side suffering of the physical condition might also evoke 
anxiety because the person is understandably worried that their life is going to be shortened or in threat in some way. Mm. So that's a biological form of the uh, cause of this problem. Then you have psychological factors. And by that I mean we are all programmed to deal with stresses in different ways. Mm -hmm. We have different coping styles. We have different defense mechanisms. These are behaviors that allow us to function. And in some people, the defensive style they have is actually anxiety producing. For example, somebody who um, has had perhaps a difficult experience in childhood might then be the sort of person who's hyper aware. So they're constantly scanning their environment for the next threat. Mm. So this is a person who might live in a safe suburb, but they might have 10 locks on their doors and so on. Right. So this is a behavior, this is a defense of using hyper alertness, hyper vigilance, being hyper aroused to fend off a potential threat. So that becomes a psychological mechanism or defense or personality style. They become a careful person. They're not going to take risks or chances in their life, which is in some ways a good thing because it's protecting them against a danger. But then if it becomes too uh, invasive of their life, then it becomes a bad thing that they won't be able to go to the supermarket or go out to a movie or enjoy themselves because they're forever planning and hyper planning what might go wrong mm -hmm. and therefore you know there might be this issue so I will stockpile this food or that thing okay. or whatever yeah. Yeah. okay so that's that's a psychological personality style mm -hmm. that might then predispose to an anxiety disorder mm -hmm. and then we have social or environmental effects and we know that for example unfortunately some people have very difficult early life they may not receive the kind of love, the confidence, the uh, nurturing that we wish every child could have from their primary caregivers. And so if there are disturbances in this, either the parent is, is uh, disabled in some way themselves emotionally, they're not able to, they're depressed or they're not able to give nurturing care, if there are separations in early life due to illness or war or whatever happens or death, um, you know, then this is a person whose early life and then subsequent environmental life might be a bit more risky. So somebody who's growing up in a, a war-torn country or somewhere where there is a lack of food or stability in their environment is going to have more anxiety because they have to be on guard for what might go wrong next. So you can see that that's an environmental factor. And all of these factors play together. It's not like there's just one biological factor. It's a constant interplay between biology, psychology, and social or environmental factors. Hmm. And is it true, this is just out of curiosity, like I was reading a report by the University of Cambridge yesterday and um, just a couple of days ago, we've marked the International Women's Day. Yes. Where all across social media, we recognize the wonderful achievements that women have made um, and the great strides they've made in different fields. But often, I think we fail to recognize the challenges that still exist for yes. women. Um, and it's rather unfortunate when I was reading the report by the University of Cambridge that anxiety as a disorder is much more likely to happen in women. And this is a phenomenon that happens all across the world. It's not just something which is localized in Australia. And although the report did not go into a lot of detail to talk about what factors or reasons might be responsible, it just piques my curiosity. Like, why is it that women are more likely to develop? I know that from having talked to professionals earlier in the podcast that anxiety and mental health conditions do not really discriminate. They can happen to anyone irrespective of age or gender or ethnicity. So why is it that women are more predisposed to developing anxiety? Yes, you ask a very um, important question. Women's mental health is, is the area that I practice in the most. And um, you're quite right that there is a four to one ratio increase. So women are four times more likely to develop anxiety disorders. And there are several uh, hypotheses that are put forward to explain this, again, in the biopsychosocial framework. Mm -hmm. So the biology um, for women is, again, a very um, interesting and perhaps 
in this instance, a little bit disadvantageous mm -hmm. in that the hormonal fluctuations that happen um, of the gonadal hormones, etc., do have an interplay. That's the estrogen, progesterone, um, the reproductive hormones, as well as other hormones, do have an interplay with the brain chemistry, which then sets up an anxiety type of platform. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some biological explanations. I think one of the other things that people have talked about is the vulnerability that women have experienced over time, that by and large women uh, tend to be smaller in stature, in size, in physical strength, mm -hmm. and therefore um, are more vulnerable in a uh, combat situation or in a uh, any kind of uh, external threat situation that um, there is a vulnerability by the mere dint of being smaller in stature, stature and other things. Mm -hmm. There is also a comment that's been made by some of the uh, anthropology side of um, the uh, studies to look at the role that um, being the protector of children brings forward as well, so that it's an anxiety that is um, secondary anxiety, so anxiety on behalf of the young. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, with the child rearing, child bearing roles that uh, women have by and large had, that um, this is another part that yes, there's a protectiveness, but that can also bring an anxiety forward that it's, it is concern for the young. Mm. And therefore that adds to the, to the whole spectrum of worrying um, aspects. And of course that then is, um, again, brings to bear the environmental threats that they are very real in many countries, that uh, rape um, as a form of, of violence is uh, experienced by women by a, a long shot more. Of course, men experience other things, but uh, for women, the threat of rape um, is, is actually a significant one and that can raise anxieties. Somebody once said, the real weapon of mass destruction is rape in war-torn situations. Mm -hmm. So for biopsychosocial reasons, there is more anxiety disorder experienced by women. Um, and um, again, this is not to say that there are not solutions. There are solutions. Um, but it is, in fact, important for people to recognize this because then you can move forward and try to actually obtain help um, for these particular situations. Um, so my next question is something that you touched on in your first answer when you said that um, anxiety can have different kinds of disorders. There's the generalized anxiety, there's PTSD, there's o OCD. Are all these anxiety disorders usually classified into the same um, treatment format? Or is there, medically, is there a difference between how professionals look at them and treat them? So um, at the moment, I think we, ha we have a tendency to do one treatment fits all, which I don't think is good enough. And I look forward to a change in that, that we can actually tailor treatment for the individual. We spoke briefly about women and anxiety disorders. So for example, when we start to think about the gender of the individual in front of us, or we're, look, we're trying to help this particular woman, what is really critical is to look at what are the factors that have led to this development of this anxiety disorder at this point. Mm -hmm. And here we find that there are differences such as, for example, a traumatic early childhood. Now that treatment for that is to empower this person by actually providing empowering psychotherapies, talking work um, and letting her work through whatever the traumas were that happened back there. So again, the treatment for anxiety disorders has still remained pretty much in the psychological therapeutic domain as the main treatments, the talking therapies. But we need to be very careful that we don't just do CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy for everybody because it doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for all types of anxiety disorders. You know, it is one type of therapy that has a place, that has a useful place, but not one size fits all. So we, we really need to think about the type of talking therapy. Mm -hmm. We may need to use antidepressant medication. We may need to use anti-anxiety medications for a short period of time. And so um, 
they're just some of the things. Some of the other things are to deal with the social or environmental threats as well as we can because um, we've all had that terrible experience of this very anxious woman that, or patient that we're trying to help and we discover to our horror later on that she's actually still living in a very threatening environment or relationship. And so until that is actually, she's brought to safety or she can deal with that herself, our treatments are going to be useless. Hmm. So there is a range of, of treatment options, but still at the moment, I don't like the fact that we tend to operate in one size fits all. We really need to get better at this. And I'm, I'm hopeful that in the future, research and uh, uh, community involvement will actually lead us to better ways to deal with anxiety for the individual. I think that's a good point as well. Like, and because when I was preparing for the interview and I'd read like a lot of research on this and in my own work as a mental health speaker, I've talked to professionals and they always say that anxiety and depression are treatable, that you must give and you must have a message of hope for the people who are going through this because they can make through. Yet there are people who have written books, who have written journal articles and they said, yes, it's treatable, but there is no silver bullet. There is no sure shot. And so that raises the question, is anxiety and depression or anxiety in particular fully 100% treatable or is it like a roller coaster? Some days will be ups and downs and there will be trials and errors solely because hope is great, but realism is greater. Yes, perhaps. that's a good point. I think, I think you're quite right that uh, it is important to be honest and it depends what we're trying to deal with. You know, if we're dealing with generalized anxiety disorder, again, we, each one of these conditions has a spectrum. So sometimes it's almost like saying, well, what is it that's stopping you from having a good quality of life? It may not be the entire spectrum of symptoms that are included in GAD. Mm. It may be that the person is saying, I can live with symptoms A, B, C and D, but can you fix this particular issue because I really do want to be able to um, go out into a crowded um, shopping centre. That's the thing that's bothering me the most because my job depends on it or something like that. Mm. I think we always have to be honest about the limitations that we have, but working with the individual to understand her or his priorities mm. and then deal with the priorities in the best way we can, but first doing no harm, I think is really critical. So I don't like seeing uh, medication splashed around, like just take this, it's going to be fine. It's not. It is about actually saying, okay, we can use this for, for helping you sleep. We can use this if you're starting to have panic because that's so awful that we have to help with the panic attacks. But you're always going to be that person who will be risk averse and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That is okay. We're all different uh, and we should not strive to be all the same. Yeah, totally not. I agree with that. And that brings me to the last question, which is quite topical, in fact. Um, you've already mentioned this in the conversation. There's been this collective sense of panic that's going around across the world, particularly in Australia, which is manifesting in rather unpredictable and irrational ways where people are stocking up on toilet papers, on staple goods like canned foods and ready-made pasta. What advice in your professional experience would you have for the general community members, um, including myself? I won't single myself out. And how do you make sense of this situation, which seems to be um, driven by fear? Look, I have to say, I, I stand back at, and look at what's going on in our world at the moment, and I think it's unbelievably um, bad in terms of mental health. And I think the worst thing is has been all this panic. Uh, what, you know, when we look at the data and the experts in, in infectious diseases are on top of this, you know, the data for this particular virus Sure, nobody wants to get sick, but can we put it in perspective? You know, this is a virus. We're always going to have viruses. We have always had viruses. I don't quite understand why things have got to this fever pitch at the moment, mm. but it's almost as if um, there's a tribal fear that's very primitive underlying this. 
In the first instances, when the reports of the coronavirus broke out, and it was in Wuhan province in China, we saw some horrible racism. And that's a racism is tribal, it's primitive. It's where people dig in and say, if I just have my people and people who look like me and that's it, and we close the borders and that's it, we'll all be fine. And there was almost this very primitive fear response in, embedded in racism at the early time of this outbreak. Then as more countries started to um, experience uh, their population having the infection, it has spread to uh, include others. Mm -hmm. And so again, this kind of digging in um, response has occurred. Mm -hmm. The hoarding response is another interesting one because it's almost as if people are expecting that the world is ending. Yeah. and. That has driven a whole lot of other people to then also stockpile and that then leads to businesses closing, it leads to schools shutting down and so on and so on. Mm. I, I think this is a runaway train and right. when we look at the response it seems out of proportion to the actual illness. Nobody wants to get sick, I'm not denying that, mm. but we will always have sicknesses, we will always have viruses because we live together you know, we cannot live in bubbles. And I think that um, the other factor that I've wondered about is we've reached a stage of existence which is extremely comfortable in this country, very comfortable. Um, we have everything at our fingertips. We don't live in a war situation. We have plenty of clean air, plenty of water, great food sources and so on. So it's as if we've become extremely reluctant to face any kind of hardship um, or in, and that we panic about anything that threatens this particular very, very comfortable, luxurious lifestyle that is something that we uh, feel entitled to have. Right. So there's that factor as well. Mm. Um, it is quite a phenomenon that we're, we're seeing happen. Mm. Uh, I don't know where we're all going to end up, but uh, unfortunately I think the economic, the mental health um, uh, factors are far outweighing the actual infectious diseases mm. at the moment. Mm. And I, I'm like you, watching and hoping that um, common sense will end up prevailing. Yeah. That's, that's a wonderful point to end on. Uh, let's hope common sense will prevail and people who actually need those essentials in the time of need are actually able to have easy access to them. They are not faced with empty shelves when they need it. Um, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with me. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Um, like I always say, the work that you do is important for a lot of people, so please keep going. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So this was my conversation with Professor Kulkarni. I learned so much about anxiety, its causes and treatment from talking to her. I really hope you found this useful and helpful because Creating awareness about mental health conditions, reducing stigma, and encouraging people who might be suffering from these conditions to seek help is one of the most important reasons why I've chosen to talk about mental health in this podcast. As someone who has been living with depression and anxiety for many years now, I can understand how difficult things seem on certain days and times. But it's important for us to reach out learn about what we are going through and get help. There is no shame in it and at all. In fact, one of the other reasons why I started this podcast and started talking about mental health in it is to build a community of supportive people who look out for each other because knowing that we are not alone in this can make a huge difference to how we feel. And with this, we've reached the end of another episode of the Quality Talk podcast. As you all know, I create new episodes every Friday and you can find us on Spotify, YouTube and Google Podcasts. Please feel free to spread the word about this podcast because as of now, I'm doing all the work on my own and using my own resources, which is, as you might imagine, quite hard. Without any promoters or advertisers, things are challenging, which is why I'm reaching out to you for help to make this podcast a success. I hope you can accompany me and help me in this journey. I'll see you all next Friday with a new episode talking about something that matters to all of us. 
if you have an idea that i should address or talk about in the podcast if you have comments about the podcast or would simply like to give me feedback please leave me a comment or a message on my instagram account my instagram handle is at mr prashant v or my twitter account and my twitter handle is at mr prashant underscore b i look forward to hearing from you until then have a wonderful week stay safe and stay healthy